episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime and today it is great scott to true crime phil the show so good it happens every friday and uh little inside baseball got the finger the the very scary finger wag from phil waters it's usually like this actually (laughs) and he said i'll tell you what these time changes um, and today's time change is courtesy of Scott Duffy. He had uh, something to do at uh, the University of Wilmington. He is the director of criminal justice. And so we had to move the time back. But now that Phil is off the big island, we are typically live at 1230 p.m. Eastern time. But we made an adjustment for Scott. The person didn't like it. By the way, Phil, your hair looks stunning today. It really um, looks neat, clean. Uh, beard trim, yeah. Barber. So this is the. Uh, I had to resort to my uh, Texas look, off the island look, and so here mm. it is. Oh, so off the island, you you trim the goatee. Yeah. Look at this. That's mainly uh, by request of the boss. So. Hmm. Bosses never like long goatees. Look at this. KCL, a uh, YouTube member. Leanne, YouTube member. Uh, Katarina, YouTube member. Ned Smith, YouTube member. Um, and, uh, yeah, today, by the way, sad day. Today is uh, my pops's, would have been his 90th birthday. Passed oh, wow. in March. There he is. Wow. Kissing my mom at their wedding. His college picture, there he is on the right, looking dapper in a tuxedo. It's someone forced to wear a tuxedo at someone's wedding. But uh, would have turned 90 years old. Uh, can't believe he's gone, but he is. And uh, I'll say a special prayer for him this evening. So uh, there you have it. Um, well, I, know how you, I know how you feel. Uh, yesterday was the memorial service for my brother-in-law. Mm. Who passed away at the age of 70 mm. um, back in June when we were in Hawaii and a uh, uh, great guy, great guy. And uh, well, we know, we know where he went home to. We know where he resides. So mm. We're good. May they all rest in peace. That's all I can say. Uh, there's enough torture on this planet in this lifetime. So let him rest in peace. And by the way, uh, We were thrown off of YouTube yesterday, not because of anything we did, but because of Mother Nature. Uh, We have flooding here in uh, Miami, Fort Lauderdale area. Just got our power back on in the middle of the night. So we are good to go today. A quick reminder, please uh, support us on Patreon, YouTube. And if you're in the car and you can listen on audio platform, that is a massive, massive help uh, to us because... Those audio numbers are very important. Uh, The COE just flagged me. There is breaking news on a Friday afternoon at 5.08 p.m. Eastern time. Alec Murdoch reaches a plea deal just days before trial. It is financial criminal cases. Uh, Again, cutting a deal. Agreed to a plea deal with Circuit Court Judge Clifton Newman, who was the judge presiding over his... uh, Murder trial. He was accused of siphoning off insurance settlement funds in the death of the murder Murdoch's longtime housekeeper, Gloria Satterfield. Uh, the list goes on. Cops a deal. There will be no more trial on the financial side for Alec Murdoch, but he uh, he has copped a deal. Uh, Phil, I was watching a clip of you and your buddy Mark Castellano last night. <laughs> does that uh, does that make sense to you? It does make sense to me. That was the case that kind of got all this media stuff started. Uh, it was featured on, it's the Michelle Warner case is her name. Hmm. That's the young lady, the mother of his son who he murdered and then put her in a closet and then took his son to Lubbock, 
Texas, where his parents resided, then left him there, then came back to Houston, took her out of the closet, put her in a big plastic tub, hauled her back to Lubbock in her car, and left her in the back seat because he wasn't manly enough to put her in the trunk and uh, let that car sit there with her in the back seat for about two days mm. in his parents' driveway. And then he decided that he could not. The way he put it to me was that he was tired of smoking cigars, which is the, the cure for um, the odor that comes out when a body decomposes. So he was tired of smoking cigars in her car while he drove around with her. And then he decided to deposit her body in a, in an oil field in Midland, which is adjoining to Lubbock and uh, went on about his merry way. And we ended up, it was a pure confession case. We had no evidence. We had no body. We had no scene. We had no witnesses, and we brought him in. It's a you can watch the show. It was on Forty Eight Hours, mm. called Gone. Mm. Doctor Phil got involved in it, and the ultimate outcome was is that I was able to obtain a confession from him. He was convicted and is now serving time in prison. Wow, uh, Mark Kasky, yeah. For the many days you have remaining on planet Earth, uh, will you ever be able to forget the smell of a decomposing human body? Will that forever be entrenched in your nostrils? No, I guess the only other, the only, the two things that I will not forget will be a decomposing body and a burned body. Yeah, those are mm. pretty uh, distinct aromas. Mm. That's a good way to put it. Uh, Scott Duffy, if I didn't know better, I would think that you were professor emeritus at Princeton <laughs> University. Uh, you're wearing orange and black. You have a fireplace. The only thing you are missing right now is a pipe. Do you, do you own a pipe? I don't own a pipe. I should get one. A straw are pipe. Are you thinking about getting a pipe? No. My grandpa Milton smoked a pipe. My, this is so weird. 2023, my father's father... My own grandfather was born in 1896, so he had <clears throat> he had my dad incredibly late back then, and then my dad had me fairly late. I don't think I could find someone my age with a grandfather born in 1896, but lo and behold, uh, he was born in 1896. He escaped from uh, before World War II, so he didn't really escape, but he left Europe, left Romania, and you know what he did? He was a um, tobacco picker in Cuba. He spoke mm. fluent Spanish. He came to Cuba before he came to the United States of America. He was an interesting guy. Wow. And then he was in the plastic, he had a plastics. But when there were once a time, once upon a time, uh, before everything was on an iPhone and people, I guess people still carry wallets. He, he used to make those plastic inserts for photos and wallets. Um, and he was missing a few fingers because one day when he was cutting that plastic, he got a couple of his fingers in the way. Um, one of the sweetest men, Grandpa Milton. Never forget Grandpa Milton. Um, interesting that I'm remembering him on my father's birthday because I don't usually sit here and talk about Grandpa Milton. So let's remember the four victims of the Long Island serial killer um, and just round it all out here. We've got Amber Lynn Costello, 27, Melissa Bartholomew, 24, Megan Waterman, 22, and Rex Hewerman, the Long Island serial killer, is also... Uh, the prime suspect in the murder of 25-year-old Maureen Brainerd Barnes. She was the first of the so-called Gilgo Four. You're looking at it right then and there uh, to disappear. Um, and there's quite a bit of uh, news surrounding this all of a sudden. Uh, let us remember these four victims. You're looking at the so-called Gilgo Four uh, right here. We tend to give these people names, but uh, just like the Idaho four, but they are human beings with families and they're the four and there could be many more Rex Shurman victims. There's a question right off the out of the gates here. Uh, Phil Waters, do you think Rex and his wife could be like 
Bernardo and Homolka in Ontario, Canada, which I know nothing about. She was given a deal, but when tapes were discovered, she was the aggressive one of the two. Um, you have, do you have any concerns about uh, this Asa Ellerip, the wife of Rex Heuerman? And we're going to talk about why she was in the news this week. In the context of that question uh, and just watching her and I, th I think she's spoken a little bit and um, she doesn't strike me as being the aggressor, the aggressive one in this relationship. Uh, he is the one that looks to be the, the leader of the pack in this thing. And he, uh, he's got a countenance about him, but I don't think he's going to let any woman run his business in any way, shape, or form. And that's just my observation of him. That's just my opinion of him. I don't think that uh, there's always a concern that this, that the wife has been involved in the murders while she may have been involved in the ridiculous, depraved sexual activities. That does not necessarily mean that she's involved in the murder. So I think there is a, a line of demarcation there for her. And I may be wrong. But I just don't have a sense that that she's involved in the murders. I think that I think that at one point they have found a, a hair that belonged to her. Uh, her DNA came back to the hair, I believe, if I remember that correctly. And all that means is is that whatever he used to transport or conceal or cover up those bodies uh, that may have happened at his residence that it would not be a, a, a big leap for one of her hairs or some sort of DNA presence from her to be on that particular material. So, but to answer the question, I don't, my sense is she's, she's not the aggressive one. Scott Duffy, while Phil was talking, um, I couldn't help but think of this. Let's say you guys switch places. Let's say you were about to go to the Big Island for six months, Scott Duffy. Would you grow out your goatee to be like seven, eight mm. inches down as Phil Waters does when he's there? Would you be doing that? Would you grow your facial hair out? Uh, you know, I, I, I did get it pretty long at one point. That was during COVID. Hmm. I grew a beard during COVID, like a crazy, like caveman beard, which I didn't. So even let know me do my up. first interruption here. Yes, please. Did you grow a caveman beard, Phil? So did you notice that Scott did not answer your question? Did you notice that? <laughs> Guys, oh, I'm so yeah, glad. So first of all, I don't think I could. I could. Um, so okay, glad let's Phil wasn't my dad. I would be so scared <laughs> and terrified. Why didn't he answer the question, Phil? Well, I don't know. He must be, I had no idea. Probably because going God? to the Big Island for six months just is not, not in the car. Put him in a shell shock. Just putting him in a in a scenario that he he never saw himself in. Okay. I guess the bigger the bigger question is: Look at this, Tali in Israel. Uncle Ferrari Phil does look sharp tonight. Yes, he does. <laughs> well, thank um, you, Scott. My the bigger question here, the more important question is. If you, get, if you came home with a goatee down to your belt buckle, would your wife force you to shave that goatee, whether you could grow it or not? Uh, yeah, I, I think without a doubt. She would make it. And, and you would shave lower it. Than my, yeah. or, would I? Sure. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not a big facial guy, so it's, um, I, I cannot grow out a full beard. Never mm -hmm. been able to, so. Mm -hmm. I didn't think I could, but during the pandemic, because it gets like patchy in here, but yeah. mm -hmm. during the pandemic, uh, if you're curious to see it, I'll post a photo uh, at Surviving the Survivor on Instagram. I know everyone's dying to see that. Well, Joe, you saw Someone's my phone uh, is ringing. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Phil. You need to go get that, Scott. Is that, yeah. is that your phone ringing? <laughs> you're calling uh, Chi Chi the chinchilla. Go ahead, Phil. The uh, um, You saw my pictures when I was a narc. So to answer your question about yeah. a caveman beard, I mean, yeah. I would I would categorize it a biker beard, but Billy, you were you had a lot of other other things going on there. Uh, a mullet was one of them, which I love. Major yeah. mullet, uh, which I pulled back into a ponytail, and then I had uh, 
those were the days of vanilla ice. I had lightning bolts shaved in the side of my head. And uh, That's so awesome. Also the days of Miami mm. Vice. I had two, I had a, I had a gold hoop and a diamond stud earrings. And uh, now when you were doing undercover, your wife had to let you do it, right? Cause it was for work. Well, Hey, the benefit to her was a different guy would come home every night. <laughs> and let me, what would the kids say? They were home then. What would the kids say when dad would come home with lightning well, bolts? When I, <laughs> the girls, not a big deal. Now, my son was uh, about four years old. And of course, I did what all cops that become narcs do. I had to run out and get that earring, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did. Love it. And my son saw it and immediately became incensed, four years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he ran up to me and he started pounding on my knees mm. and my thighs and started saying, girls wear earrings, dad. Guys don't wear earrings. So I'm sitting there, you know, wonder where he heard that from, right? Uh, <laughs> but then, and I told him, I said, son, I said, it's just for the job, just for work. And when I mm. finish doing this type of work, I'll take it out. And mm. he looked, you sure? And I said, yeah, I'll take it out. So then later on, we were, uh, one night, we were, uh, my wife and I were in bed, and she was watching TV, I was reading a book, and and uh, my son comes ripping into the bedroom, jumps on the bed, and goes immediately under the sheets to the bottom of the sheets. I mean, like tearing the bed up, and I'm like, mm. and I raise the sheets up, I go, I go Shane, what, what are you doing? How old is he at this point? Because you said he's years four. late. He's four years old. Oh, four. Okay. About, about four years old. I thought he was 24. You said years no, no, no. later. He's four years old. Four years old. Yeah. And he says, uh, and I said, Shane, what are you doing? And he looks at me with this incredulous look on his face. And he says, I'm working undercover, Dad. <laughs> True story. True story. That's a smart kid. So at that point in time, he had resigned. He, you know, he he been able to reconcile the earring. Mm. He understood what I was doing, but this was his, in his four-year-old little mind. This is what it meant. So I'm working mm. undercover. Wow. So then later on, I went to pick him up at the daycare and he was sitting there and there was this little obnoxious little boy sitting there and he's looking at me and he's, he's just staring at me. And uh, Shane is sitting right next to him. And he says, so what's the deal with the earring? The kid does. Mm. And before I could even answer, Shane looks at him and says, my dad works undercover. Love it. So Love it was it. pretty funny. So, yes, it was. a. That's awesome. It was yeah, a the, uh, great time. The uh, kid's friends, I guess. Look at this. Philadelphia shoulder search and they must have thought you're the coolest dad because you know Shane's dad had the earring <laughs> hi to scott well, i don't know his dad was i don't know a pantyhose salesman or something yeah exactly <laughs> look at that. hi to scott from the main line talking Hello. to philly lingo yep. um exactly. from yeah. the main line by the way so when i was little my grandmother lived in switzerland and, I, and back in those days you had to call the uh the overseas operator and i always had this vision that the operator was in the little booth and somewhere halfway in between in the ocean, like on the sand, like under the sand, you know, 1500 miles between here and Europe. But then I found out that wasn't true, but fast forward to today and we live right near a bridge that goes up and down for the boats. And there's a little bridge house. And my kids always ask me if the person lives in there. And I say, of course they live in there. Why wouldn't they? So I think my kids all think that the bridge man or woman that lifts the bridge up and down lives inside that little house. And one day they'll figure out that it's true. They live inside the house. Um, Lindsay Shea says, thank God it's Friday. Kathleen Bar Barrett, uh, sunny Oregon. I love how she always says it's always sunny in Oregon. Stacy Q, love this channel. It's especially weird on Fridays. I warn you. Um, someone's saying hi to Space Coast behind the scenes. COE. Behind the scenes, Steve Cohen behind the scenes. And uh, this is show number two today because we were going to do a show last night, which we couldn't do because of uh, 
power outages. So there's Catherine in Maui, Aloha Friday, two show bonus. Yes, it is. Is Phil late again? Just barely today, but uh, <laughs> prom he promptly blamed that on Scott Duffy. I don't blame him. Um, Rex Hewerman. This is him in case you don't know who he is. The and big guy. Uh, big the guy. Big Fourth court appearance this past week, but what was different about this court appearance is this, if I may play it. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. What is that? Well, that is my ringtone for my office phone. How many? This guy has more ringtones than anyone. I don't even know how to have a well, creator that's, ringtone. That's, Darryl, that, that's uh, Hall and Oates. That's Private Eyes. So. <laughs> It's all it's all it's all subject appropriate. So yes, it, sorry yes. about that. Um, Bill Waters really into ringtones. So look at this uh, from Paul Schoenbaum. Hello, STS Nation, Paul. Uh, here's the video. We're going to look at this real quick. This is uh, Rex Sherman's wife going into court this week. Let's take a look. Um, she's being hounded here, as you can tell. She also arrived in a silver Mercedes. Uh, she's apparently broke, but shows up in her Mercedes. By the way, credit to WCBS local news in New York for this video. Courtesy CBS News New York. You can see it there. So that is her going into court. Gaggle of reporters. We'll play it again. Um, fourth time he was in court. And this time, Scott Duffy, a circus atmosphere. Uh, she's actually heard uh, in the courtroom laughing a little bit and smiling. This is quite a turnaround. This is a woman who refused to talk to reporters, ran from reporters. What on earth, Scott Duffy, do you think is going on here? Why the sudden 180? Why is she suddenly appearing at her now? Well, not now ex, but soon to be ex-husband's court appearances, who is accused of some of the most heinous crimes one can be accused of. What do you think is going on? I don't know. <laughs> it's, this is this got me stumped. It's um, you know, I I don't know why she filed for divorce uh, in the first place. I don't know if they were on the outs and this was the you know the the final straw, or or did it make sense to to file for divorce to protect some assets because you know that there, there's going to be a lot of. Uh, not only for for the criminal side of it, but the civil side, and and so there could be a lot of um, damages resulting from such. So I'm not, I I don't know what the extent of their relationship is, and and if the if the divorce is purely to protect assets, I I I don't see any reason why she wouldn't be in his corner at every at every uh, turn. Uh Bill Waters and get yes, his sir. panties in a wad after I tell him this part of the story, but this is why I'm saving this part for Phil to get his panties in a wad. Phil, uh, when she got out of her silver Mercedes Benz claiming to be broke, Asa Ellerip arrived at the Arthur M. Cromartie courthouse in Riverhead, Long Island. She was with a Peacock documentary film crew, otherwise known as NBC's film crew. And she was actually wearing a lavalier microphone um, as she entered the courthouse. I'm assuming they made her take it off before she actually went into court. But I'm just curious what you think, because she had this, you know, she was kind of glammed up. It is clear that she is working with some kind of documentary crew channel, a documentary crew. What are your thoughts on this? Is it, I mean, do you have a, a, a thought one way or the other? Is it, too premature. There hasn't been a trial yet. She obviously needs money. She said it uh, publicly. You think that she's doing this for the money? What is the motive behind being with a uh, documentary film crew? And she's she's mic'd up. She's trying to record things. In, yeah, they are with in her. Vicious way or uh, not? In a, they they actually had a camera out as she was being gaggled through the media. Um, so she's trying, she's trying to do a documentary on, I guess they're going to be making a documentary about her husband, her now infamous husband. And uh, there has been no trial. This is his fourth court appearance. The trial is very far away, but it's clear that she's in the pockets of someone at uh, 
peacock documentaries because they have they are with mm. her and they are making some sort of i mean you can only presume that they're making a movie about uh him using her and and say the him and hers again the him and her would be rex who is in jail and his wife okay. asa okay. so okay. asa is the one she's my she had a microphone on is what i'm saying okay so the wife had a microphone on. She came okay, with. Okay, yeah, this is where I'm confused. Okay, yeah. so and she had an entourage. She had an entourage, and there was a cameraman with her. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I was, I was thought this was yeah. some sort of no. correspondent from NBC no, was, or something. No, no, it was probably just me being very unclear as usual. Oh, okay. No, so, so this evildoer's wife has got the camera and has the mic. Rex Uerman's wife, Asa. Okay. Correct. Correct. Okay. Correct. Well, I think they've talked repeatedly about how she's financially been destitute. She's destitute. Mm -hmm. uh, having a hard time dealing with all of this. She's going through the process of a divorce. And who knows? Somebody's approached her and said, we can make a ton of money. And here's what I would suggest you do. We're going to we're going to roll this out as some sort of a personal autobiographical documentary. So here we go. We're going to wire you up. We're going to have the camera with you and go do what you're going to do. So that that's what it sounds like. I mean, there's got to be some other purpose behind it other than just getting attention. I think she's getting more attention than she ever, ever dreamed she would get. So uh, I would imagine there's a financial motivation behind it I, I would have to assume that that is true uh the new york post says that is that that the icelandic native looked noticeably calmer and more put together than in her quote-unquote disoriented first weeks scott duffy in court she reportedly smiled and nodded at rex huerman from whom she filed for divorce back on july 19th I don't know, Scott. I mean, if you put on your psychologist hat today, what do you think is going on here? She, by the way, Caitlin Armstrong sentenced to 90 years uh, where she belongs, uh, convicted yesterday of uh, first degree murder. But Scott Duffy, um, I mean, do you have any sort of I mean, earlier you said you had no idea. So that's why I have to ask you again. Do you have an idea now? Why would she suddenly be friends with a guy that is? Uh, proverbially, pro pro proverbially thrown her under the bus here. She's now financially in shambles as a result. No more husband. The family's torn apart. Why do you think she's smiling and nodding at him suddenly? Well, first, possibly cameras are watching, right? We uh, so if she has now been prepped, and you, and you you've been in the business quite a bit. You prep your witnesses, and so you also prep your people who are going to be the focal point of your cameras. So I'll go back. You don't have to be a psychologist. Just follow the the breadcrumbs as an investigator. If if there are no issues with them, if 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 he was never arrested would she be filing for divorce? And, and so if life was just going to continue, I'll go back to if, if this is in the works to make money and, and then of course, to, um, to, to protect assets, whatever, whatever Peacock or whatever production company is going to be paying, he would not be able to benefit. Right. I mean, most States have in place that, you cannot benefit from your crimes and any money made from books, et cetera, would, would go pay to a victim's compensation fund. So perhaps be, the divorce really is a well um, thought out plan to protect your assets and whatever she makes, she'll be able to, uh, to keep that's, you know, that's, that's, I think a logical assumption and, and we'll see how she, um, you know, I I don't think it's fake that she's smiling and winking and doing whatever to him. I think it it will come down to um, if 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 he's forever going to be locked up. You know, a divorce is only going to um, to protect assets. It's it's, it's uh, you know unlike what typically brings people to a divorce. They just can't be together anymore and and so uh, part separate ways. So here. You know, I, I think there is definitely something underlying and it's it's not good.
Mm. Uh, Cynthia Sweesey, uh, I just found the channel the other day. I wish I could join. I'm sorry all my extra money goes to my daughter, but I enjoy her. No need to apologize. However, if you can give us five stars on audio, it goes a long way. We'd appreciate that. And thank you for being with us and welcome to SDS Nation Rula. Uh, it is a Friday, so we take questions like this. This has to go to Phil. Phil, how do you unsee and get on with day-to-day -day life when you see dead bodies? A uh, beautiful Friday afternoon subject. Uh, would you care to address that, Phil Waters? Well, I don't. I've answered this type of question over and over again and uh, grounded in my faith. And, and I know that I was there for that purpose uh, to root out the right person who had done the wrong thing. And, and uh, I think of uh, and see that there's a, a measure of justice and a sense of peace brought to the families and the friends of the victims. And uh, I think the only, uh, and I think I've talked about this before, um, the images that were, I think I've said before over and over again, that we just have a few in us are the dead baby cases or the dead, dead children that that's those are tough and uh, especially you know when I was when I was working I had three children of my own and it was tough it was tough to see those uh, little lives snuffed out before they even had a chance and, uh, and, and what whatever the circumstances were so it's just I think in my case uh, the Lord put me where he wanted me to do uh, to do his work. On a uh, serious note, we both or we all owe Scott and uh, Phil a debt of gratitude. They did uh, service to their city, their nation, and uh, they saw things that none of us would ever want to see. Uh, and they did it repeatedly. And I know Phil has said that he was called to, I think, all the all the dead children. Is that right? Dead, dead babies. Is that right, Phil? You would get called to all those. Um and I mean, not me personally, but our, our here I made a lot of them, but our division in homicide in Houston, we made every, every dead baby scene that was not a medical death in a hospital. And uh, yeah, they're, they're yeah. tough. I think we've only got a few of those in us. Yeah. There's no, uh, there's no easy way around that. So uh, thanks to Phil and Scott for their service. Betty majors, if Scott got a pipe, he would next need to get a smoking jacket and that would be kind of creepy. Uh, misdemeanor OG Asa is making a peacock documentary and he's the reason she was in court. Thanks to her lawyer said, setting it all up money, money, money. So uh, there, there you go. People are uh, making the presumption. It is all about money. Special shout out to Tali. Who's coming to us from Israel war torn Israel. Uh, so I hope she's staying safe. Um, Moving forward, so the hearing itself was uh, quite the circus. Uh, it lasted 30 minutes, Phil Waters. Defense attorney Michael Brown, who's representing Rex Huerman, he made it very clear in court that day he wants all the investigators' notes. He wants all of their notes. Can we make an assumption as to why he would want that, Phil? Well, sure. Uh, in Houston... There was a there was uh, always the opportunity if the if the defense attorney wanted to have field notes notes from the detectives they were they could get access to them and there was a point in time when a new captain to the division who was also a lawyer by the way um, made that part of the policy those notes would be attached to the case file. So um, it's, it's, it's no big secret why they would want to see those notes because there are sometimes notes that are made in the course of an investigation do not 100% make their way into the report. Uh, not because anybody's trying to hide anything, but because they don't have any significance, as it turns out, to the investigation itself. So the defense attorneys can take those things and they can conflate whatever they see in those notes and try to, when that 
detective gets on the stand, they're going to say, well, this was in the report, but this was in the notes. Why wasn't this in the report? You know, blah, blah, blah. So it so, is just, it's just a way to, to confuse the jury and to conflate issues that are really non-issues. But no, I have no, I'm not surprised at all. that they. Phil, would, Phil would you carry a, when you went to a homicide scene, are you carrying a physical notebook? Like uh, yes. you are and you take, and, and oh, like, yeah. Give me an example. Like, what would you like? What's something you would jot down in your notebook? What would you What would you write? Well, it would depend on which side of it that I was working. But when I walk into the into the scene, if I'm working the scene side, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to start making notes about the body. And we have a in in, in HPD. I, I assume they still have something like it. But we had a card. One side was the scene side. The other side was the witness side. So it gave us a guide on the things that we needed to do step by step. So and that that just is to have a consistency about how homicide investigations in Houston are conducted. So we're all operating off of the same the same outline and that we and we put those what we call them blue backs. We put those together in that in that same format so in the reports in that in that format and so i would be making notes about the of course the time i got the call the time that i arrived uh, who called me who, who delivered the uh, the scene to me when i get there who did i meet with first the primary officers what did he tell me and this is all brief summaries uh going throughout the report and then uh, if i'm working the same side i begin working the scene by noting where the body is, uh, figuring out which way north is, and, and we all start, start operating, get with the crime scene units. And so we're all operating again on the same page with the same uh, parameters. And uh, then you just start making your, your notes regarding evidence, what you see, what your first impressions are. And then we have a very specific part of those uh, part of that outline where we would the position of the body and I'm talking about detailed position of the body if the right arm was at a 90 degree angle the left arm is straight at the side very detailed about body positions and of course and I would I would take and then we, we talk about the weather uh, talk about the lighting Hmm. You know, the very aspects of this physical scene that we're looking at, what kind of a structure is it? Are we inside? Are we outside? What's what's in the room? Where is the body in the room? And so it's uh, a lot of detailed notes. Now, if you're working on the witness side, it's it's the same type of thing, but you're dealing with people. So this person was at the scene. This was the witness at the scene I spoke with. I later brought them down and took a either a written statement from them or a video recorded statement from them. I may have taken an audio statement from them at the scene and didn't think that they had enough information that required me to send them down for a written statement or a video statement. So, um, and then, and then your, and your primary focus there is people. And uh, you might do a canvas. If you're if you're working the witness side of it, you might canvas the area. So there are very specific functions of whatever side you're working. And I'm the guy I, I'm the type of guy that I made copious notes. I'm a detailed guy. I'd like to put everything in there that I could put in there. And again, there because I take a lot of notes and most homicide cops do. There are just some things when you start going into the report, you start to edit out some of the things you may have made a note of because it, it, it had no significance as it turned mm -hmm. out. And mm -hmm. so there's really no, uh, there's not a point in putting in something that made no difference. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, again, defense attorneys, might take those notes and have taken those notes and they'll see that and they'll say, why isn't this in the report? And that would be my response. There was no investigative significance or probative value to that, whatever I was looking at and made that note. Hmm. So, 
Did I hear you say that you uh, you guys decide uh, which which direction is north, and that way you Correct. can say, that's interesting. Um, that way you can say the body's positioned in a northeast or whatever it is. You could say refrigerator is open in a northwest or whatever it is. Really, yes. interesting. very interesting. The front door, the front door faces west. Uh, mm. You know the 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 we're in a bedroom and the east wall, the body. So yeah, yeah, we have to get a. We have to get a, a, a location about uh, where North is so that we all and that that becomes important with the crime scene unit because the crime scene unit. Now, there was times where I would just for my own purposes in my notes, I would make a diagram of the scene itself. I mean, it's very, you know, stick figures and that kind of thing. But the crime scene unit. Makes a detailed scaled diagram of the scene itself. And uh, it's they're they're really those guys uh, amazing um, when they do that. And so, um, yeah, it's 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 important for everybody because we don't want the crime scene unit saying the body was laying against the east wall, and I'm saying it's laying against the south wall. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're all on the same page about the scene itself, so that we don't have any any conflict or contradictions. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, Copper Horse, one of our mods. Look at this. Gifted 50 Surviving the Survivor memberships. Uh, shout out to the great state of New Jersey and Copper Horse. Very generous. Thank you so much. Uh, Rex's was, wife was in her court. She's doing a documentary. Uh, she's it's, Sunflower Girl says she's getting paid a million dollars. I've never seen that. I don't know. I don't want to start rumors, but that's what Sunflower Girl is saying. Who knows what she's getting paid? I, I doubt it would be disclosed publicly, but um, she's probably getting paid a good chunk of money. Um, what happened to your new background, Joel? Well, in the course of uh, this horrific weather, somehow the COE's car is not starting. The good old minivan that Bill Waters would love to drive is not starting. Uh, appears the battery could be uh, could be dead. Ginger Snap says, do not beard shame, Scott. Scott, I apologize to you. Um, you know, I, I have very weird thoughts. One of them would be if I ever got a, if I was ever honored enough to receive a Phil Waters homicide notepad that was actually written on i would take that and i would put it inside of like fiberglass like a fiberglass thing and i would put it up as a memorabilia uh saying this is a houston homicide detective the great bill waters homicide notebook and i would put that up and well, people would say joe people, I, I i appreciate that that's a little creepy weird as i'm yeah, sure it's you know. okay it's all uh, right but i i got i i i have uh uh, all of my notepads. So. Oh, then I might take one. I have a piece of a UFC canvas like that because I'm a big diehard fan. And they, uh, I got a piece of the canvas and they put it inside, not fi like inside glass yeah. and it's memorable. Yeah, right. Yeah. I might have to get uh, one of those notebooks. Um, Scott Duffy. So this struck me uh, as being kind of unusual just because of the sheer magnitude. During the hearing, which lasted 30 minutes, Rex Hewerman's defense attorney, Michael Brown, requested all the investigators' notes, which we just talked about, prompting the prosecution to point out that they have already handed over 75% of all those materials, in addition to paperwork for all the warrants. And this is the part that got me. 14,000 photographs, Scott Duffy. Uh, does that make your uh, eyebrows raise? Is that an alarming number? I guess these are crime scene photographs or evident, you know, evidence photographs seems like a, a ton, but they were there for days um, at the scene. Um, is that an astonishingly high number or not for a case of this magnitude? No, it is. I mean, it's a, it's a high number, but it is. And I imagine we're talking uh, crime scene photos of, everything not just the search warrants executed at the house but but everything else that might might go along with the case so you're you know you're talking about um quite a large cache of um photos from from beginning to end is what i imagine what they're what they're getting and and with regards to the notebook they like asking for notebooks too because sometimes 
And uh, we, you know, you learn this early, but sometimes you forget until you're tested on the stand that officers sometimes have a tendency to doodle. And so there are things that could go inside those notebooks that have nothing to do with the crime scene. It could be, hey, I'm getting pizza tonight. I have nothing else. So I'm going to write a phone number. And um, so it's, it's things that they like to look at. You could be you could be daydreaming and drawing you know, a picture of something that may be appropriate or not appropriate. And so thereby it's something to, to attack the officer. So, Mm. you know, there, there are reasons for asking for those, for those uh, notebooks, as well as looking to, to look for discrepancies between what is written and what, what is initially put down in a notebook. So and Scott, I mean, 14,000 pictures, are they taking photos of doorknobs? Are they taking photos of drawers inside a drawer? I mean, is it just everything yeah. around, putting the refrigerator? I mean, what's going on in these photos? Yeah, so in in uh, early in my career, I was assigned to the evidence response team. So I would go in, I would be the photographer. And and like Phil, as he's taking his own pic, uh, uh, kind of... Um, drawing probably sketches and then trying to figure out, you know, different angles and so forth. So this way he doesn't have to go to somebody else. It's immediate to him as he's putting together the pieces of, of his crime scene, you know, in his head, so forth to, to, uh, as, as he goes forward in an interview, et cetera, et cetera. It's one thing to have all these different officers, crime scene texts and whatnot. And, and then and then have to go and and get those. So I I would arrive on scene. I my role would, would be to take pictures. And so I'm taking pictures from afar and picture, picture, picture leading right up to the location. So I could be taking easily 50 pictures without even getting to the crime scene. I'm I'm taking pictures of the street signs. I'm taking pictures of the all different angles. For example, if it is a house, and um, and everything else, and and then of course, once you get in, each and every room, we would assign a letter. So, for example, a closet has its own letter, the room has its own letter, and then you're documenting precisely. This is outside of video. That um, I would take pictures of each wall, just just so I have an idea. If things aren't going to necessarily be collected, it then allows the um, the agents or the detectives, whoever, who's the lead uh, on that particular crime, to be able to say, oh, yeah, now I can visually put myself in this room by looking at the pictures and then say, oh, the, 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 um, the pictures on the wall, whatever it is that's... Um, to, to be able to document every aspect of that house. And then of course you have the, the, the actual pieces of evidence. So you're taking pictures where the evidence is located, then taking pictures of the evidence as it's being, you know, in its seized format and, uh, and then it's bagged and tagged format. So, um, it's, it's definitely ordeal and, you know, 14,000, especially knowing, that uh, this house had so many different aspects to it that I can see, like, for example, the 200 and I believe 42 guns or whatever that amount, each and every gun is going to be, you know, you're going to take a picture of the gun, even though the guns are may or may not be relevant to the actual crime. Um, you're going to take pictures of the gun. You're going to take pictures of every aspect of the gun. You're going to take pictures of the serial number of the gun. Mm. And uh, so this way you have it in its original format. Then, of course, the gun has to be broken down and, you know, processed through through a gun tech in order to uh, to render it safe. So, yeah, it's 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 a like I can tell you, 9-11. I was uh, the, uh, the photographer for my team and it was I was burning through hundreds and hundreds of um, of pictures in an hour. So. Mm. And it was film. It was filmed back then, I think, Scott Duffy. It was 35 millimeter. Yes, it wow. was. <laughs> wow. Wow. I know that because I had a disposable camera on me on 9-11 for some weird reason. And I have somewhere I have photos. 
Look at this comment from MJ. Joel, I met Nick Diaz in Vegas, and I have the photo proof. Send that to me, surviving the survivor at Gmail. For those who don't know, uh, Nick Diaz is a huge name in the world of mixed martial arts. And I have my own Nick Diaz story. Uh, once a time, once upon a time before I was engaged to my wife, I was dating her. And I thought it would be cool to take her to Vegas for her birthday. And for some reason, a thousand of her friends decided to meet us because she's from LA. And I'm walking through this club with many women around my arm, which is the way I roll when I go into a Vegas nightclub, all my wife's now wife's friends. And who's the first person I see in the club? Nick Diaz. I made the mistake of tapping him on the shoulder from behind. Uh, he has fought in Japan, um, all around the world. And next thing you know, uh, Nick Diaz is sitting at our table, surrounded by the same women that I'm surrounded by. And my wife and her friends have no idea who Nick Diaz. And I have photo proof of this too, MJ. Uh, Nick Diaz hung out with us for hours and hours. The girls loved him. After a couple of drinks, they started to try to dance with Nick, who said, I don't dance. Then they tried to give Nick a drink. And he says, I don't drink. I'm a professional athlete. Then they tried to give him birthday cake. And at one point, the COE may or may not have gotten a little wild and put her arms around him and her friend Colleen. And they turned to me and go, wow, he has abs. And I said, he's a professional fighter. He fights in Japan at the Saitama Super Arena in front of 60,000 people. He now he, he's fought in the UFC. Uh, and believe it or not, Nick Diaz and I stayed friendly after that. We used to text each other. I love that guy. He's actually a really good guy. And somehow we ended up, that's a great question. Who am I? I have no idea. But somehow we ended up at a 24-hour sushi place in um, Vegas. I didn't know it existed. And Nate Diaz, who went on to become a much bigger name than Nick Diaz, showed up with all his friends. And then we were having sushi with Nate Diaz in the middle of the evening, the early hours in Las Vegas. So uh, there you go. Uh, my, my, my very own Nick Diaz uh, story. I will post it at Surviving the Survivor on Instagram, um, a photo of my beloved wife uh, hanging out with Nick Diaz, asking him why he has abs and why he won't eat birthday cake. All right, this story. So uh, Rex Hewerman, he's been in isolation. Uh, his attorney made that clear. He said that uh, he's not allowed to be in contact with other inmates. Um, as, as to why Asa Ellerip was there, Phil Waters her divorce attorney, a guy named Bob Macedino, said she wants to hear and see the evidence as it plays out in court. Uh, then then she will decide if she thinks her husband is guilty of these crimes. Um, he also signed over paperwork that she is now the sole owner of the home. But Phil Waters, I'm wondering, um, we asked Scott this. It is a weird turnaround. She seemed to want to have nothing to do with him. And then in court, they say that she was laughing and smiling at him, and uh, they seem to be very cordial. Do you have any understanding of why suddenly she would be kind to him? Well, she's got to be practical. I'm sure whatever is getting signed over to her, he's willingly, he's doing it willingly. And she's going to be there to, you know, I think kind of the, the ambush effect of all of this is worn off now. Now she's got to survive. And I don't find it. I mean, they were married for a while, right? A couple of minutes anyway. Yes. And, uh, so I, I don't find this terribly strange. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm sure whatever they went through, uh, I, I don't find it odd that she wants to see the evidence and wants to be at the trial and, and all that. So I, I don't find anything particularly strange about it. I think yeah. she's just... Um, I think this divorce thing, if that happens, I think that's just a matter of being practical. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, there was Scott, this is interesting. The attorney for, um, Rex Schuerman came out during this whole circus day at court and announced that they had almost arrested someone else. 
And that is why he was actually in part asking for these notes. Uh, he says, we're looking forward to getting those answers in an expeditious manner because we're at four or five months already. That's very important for us to go forward with the trial. How significant or insignificant is it that they, I guess, publicly told the defense team or somehow they found out that there was close to being an arrest of another individual? I assume the defense attorney is going to say, hey, they were about to arrest this guy, but arrested my guy. It's that guy. What do you think of that? Hmm. It, it'd be interesting to see if this is somebody that is somewhat conspiratorial. Is there somebody else that is known to the uh, to the humans and that this is somebody that might have partaken in something or another post evidence, post whatever, and um, in turn state's witness or. Was there somebody totally disconnected to Rex Hume and 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 so um, and then something took them a different direction? I mean, that's that's uh, you know when 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 all this started breaking, um, and I'm not talking about when Rex was arrested, but but as these bodies started to be uncovered and and then the years of trying to determine who they are, you, you know, you have you have lots of thoughts. Who is this? And and you could be writing down, hey, let's check out this person. Let's check out that. Maybe the evidence took somebody somewhere. Um, but ultimately, uh, it will come down to what what was this person involved in the case or was it totally disconnected? So it, any anything the defense can get their hands on that points away from their client is is a is a good thing for them. But then it's a good thing for law enforcement where they have a, a good logical explanation to, uh, to 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 take them in the direction that they went. So it's 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 a story. It's a narration. And it will come down to evidence that that has to be uh, well articulated as to why Rex and only Rex. And there, and there may be additional arrests connected to this, but it'd be it'd be interesting to see what who this person was and, and were they actually in the camp um, or somebody totally different and they just totally moved, moved that aside. Well, Phil Waters. Uh, so about this other near quote unquote near arrest um, that was uh, then district attorney uh, Timothy Sini, I want to say his name is S I N I uh, and Michael Brown, the defense attorney for, Rex Sherman said, and I quote here, if they went forward on what Mr. Sini wanted, somebody would have been in jail and all of you would have been pouncing on that person who's in jail. And Rex Sherman would still have went to work every morning and would have come home at night and had dinner with his family. So I want to see the evidence. Um, what about this other possible arrest? Is that going to muddy the waters in a big way for the defense? Or is that, you know, I spoke to uh, via tweet with Joe Jackalone, a former NYPD sergeant. He said, yeah, it was a almost arrest. That wasn't an arrest, but they made the the right arrest. So uh, what say you as a veteran homicide detective? Is this much ado about nothing? Well, look, it, it's as important to eliminate people in an investigation as to find the right one. I, I've had several cases where I was certain that I had the right person. I got warrants for them. I went and arrested them. And then when I began my interview with them, I realized I'm not talking to the right suspect. I'm not talking to the right person here. So this is nothing out of the ordinary. And again, these are defense attorneys trying to, and this is what they do. They're trying to try this in the public square. They're trying to influence possibly potential jurors later on down the road. This may be something that they use in court and in the prosecution. If they're smart, stuff like this, they'll get ahead of at the trial. They'll be the ones that will bring this issue up and have the detective explain why that person was not arrested. So to me, it's just it's defense attorney blathering about something that is going to turn out to be a red herring. 
Uh, they're trying to make their client look better than he looks. And the evidence right now, and, and the reason why his client gets arrested is because that's where the evidence led the investigation and the detectives. So it, it, anytime you, you, you're in an investigation, you follow the evidence. You let the, you, you let the evidence lead you where you need to be. You don't take evidence some direction that you might want it to go. And it's always a journey for the truth. So the fact that this attorney is bringing this up, oh, there's somebody else ever going to arrest. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious now at this point that they didn't arrest that person because the evidence led them to his client. Phil Waters must write a book. The title obviously will be A Journey for the Truth from America's Most Respected Detective, Phil Waters. Little bit gifting 10 surviving the survivor memberships. I say it every day. Best guests, better community. Everyone in the chat. Uh, look at this. It is raining memberships today. Lots of generous gifters. Thank you to STS Nation. Remy Noss, who is asking who I am, uh, coming to us from England, uh, welcoming the UK. Um, channel growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, yes, it is. Thanks to an amazing community. Uh, thank you all for being here. The final thing with this story, because I'm already getting bored of it. Um, Scott Duffy, there is a, um, a police sketch of a suspect, and it was from 1996. The twin brother and uh, younger sister, both siblings, of Alicia Showalter Reynolds. Uh, she is a 1996 murder victim. They say that an old state police sketch looks exactly like Rex Hurman. The quote goes, this is by her brother, now Dr. Patrick Showalter. When I saw the picture of Rex Hurman, subtract 20 years from the way he looks, 27 years from the way he looks now, it's the first time I've seen anyone look like any of the composite sketches that were done at the time of my sister's abduction. She was a 25-year-old PhD student in your neck of the woods, uh, Scott, Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. She was driving to meet her mother in Charlottesville. Her car was discovered that evening, abandoned on the shoulder of Route 29 in Culpeper, Virginia. They think that a man flagged her down, told her that he saw sparks coming from under the car and that he could take her to the dealership. That guy was described as an enormous, very tall white man. Scott Duffy, uh, tips like this are going to come in, right? How, I mean, does, does all this stuff, have to be vetted out. This is 1996. This would be the first year maybe he was even married, if that. Um, how do you go back and check this now? So in, in that particular case, was um, is that a missing person or is that a homicide and recovered body? I didn't. It is a know. it is a homicide, um, but I'm looking to see if they uh, ever found the body. Um it says murder victim, so I'm assuming yeah. they found a body. Yeah, so so take that. You if you have a body, and if if the uh, you know there there are patterns here as we can see in Gilgo Beach, so it would be very much. And even though this sounds like it's on the early end, you know a lot of questions are: Hey, when did this guy flip the switch? Was it just in in 2000? Um, I believe, do we have it at 2006 for the first victim of Gilgo Beach going back for, but it's going back enough to where you have, okay, what's happened after the body started to be uncovered and nothing apparently has taken place. So we have this pre-date and this, these post-dates where now you can go elsewhere and and track these these uh, steps of Rex, and that's that's ultimately what you're looking for. Is we we keep talking about where's the evidence going to take you? Is there DNA? Is there partial DNA? Is there fibers? Their hair? Are there some something that they uh, they can now put pieces together, or 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 move away and say, okay, the uh, the sketch was was close, but nothing else is is connecting or something we have DNA or something totally takes us in a different direction. So you're, there are very similar cases. It's amazing when you look throughout the country and a lot of cold cases out there that do have similarities and it's uh, 
it's important for these detectives to give a good look. And uh, there's nothing more than that detective who wants to to solve that case. So if something can lead them now that they have an identity, absolutely, they're going to pursue it. But but it comes down to will the evidence ultimately take them there and then start to look at Rex's uh, past in 1996 and see if you can find something that that will at least show him traveling from up north, south, and whatnot. That something that puts him there, and and there could be documents that are found in the house that, and that's why pictures are important. So you may have a 1996 uh, receipt of a gas station that you're like. I don't have any cases, and so thereby I may not seize this evidence, but there's nothing wrong with taking a picture of it. And so those are all those things that that will hopefully come to light and say, ah, this 1996 gas station in Virginia meant nothing, but but now it means something. And Mm -hmm. it will it will be tedious work like that that will help either steer the direction uh the the case into looking at Rex or discounting him and saying, okay, it's unfortunate, but it's not our guy. Mm. Um, by the way, Scott Duffy has been on with me with the Morins. I'm in close contact with Rachel Morin's family. She is the mother of five, 37 years old, who was brutally murdered on that Maryland hiking trail. And uh, we are working, we're going to probably have her mother and brother and uh, others on very soon there's there's no movement in terms of catching a suspect or trying to get closer but there is movement with the case in terms of what they're trying to do so uh i'm gonna have scott on with the morins as soon as they're ready uh to come on copper horse look at this donated donated 150 memberships um i don't even know what to say she's making mcspunky look foolish love you mcspunky but um amazing so thank you so much uh, Marlon Rando knows what's up. You guys have great content and the best guests and a better community keeps me coming back. Uh, glad to have you here. Hope you do come back. Scott Duffy, I couldn't help but wonder this when you told us that you were the uh, FBI photographer on your uh, team for a while. When you go on a Duffy family vacation, um, are you the de facto photographer? Are you the guy in the Hawaiian shirt with the Canon camera strap around your neck taking all the pictures? Then or now with the phone, everybody's taking pictures. <laughs> well, <laughs> then. How about then? Yeah, and it, yeah, because, um, you know, one thing I liked about the FBI is they said, you know, you, because they bought the nicest cameras. We we always seem to have the nicest equipment. And, and I would say to my bosses, I really got to get familiar with this camera so I'm not trying to figure it out when at a crime scene. So I'm going to need to take this home and use it. And uh, of course, break it in. And so I would, I would use my camera quite a bit. Of course, making sure digitally wise, it's a different story. You don't want to mix crime scene and personal photos, but back then 35 millimeter, take it out, develop it. And then Mm. that was that. Hopefully crime scene photos and family photos are never one in the same. Let's hope a uh, little bit says, That's Phil, good. you and my husband have the same birthday and he has been walking with an extra strut ever since he saw that. Thanks for making him happy. I guess he thinks that he is a homicide detective. Uh, look well, at this. Hey, that's, that's funny. Big gums, evil doers and boo hoo hooers an autobiography by Phil waters. Ah. I, I like this. Uh, I like this. So uh, any other titles for Phil's autobiography, <laughs> send them our way and we'll read them here. Um, moving on here, bored of the Long Island serial killer already. On to Samantha Wall. She is the synagogue president. And I texted this to Phil and Scott because this was weird. Uh, the latest news with this, she's the Detroit synagogue president, 40 years old, found stabbed to death on a sidewalk on October 21st. She was reportedly stabbed in her home then stumbled outside. Well, Crime Stoppers are now offering $15,000 for tips leading to an arrest. But what's interesting about this, Phil Waters, authorities arrested and released a suspect, a male acquaintance of Samantha Wall's 
in early November, offering no details about his statement to the police on the killing. Police still say there's no evidence of a hate crime. What is going on here, Phil Waters? This is very odd. It is odd the way they... So you go back to the beginning. So we first become aware of this person because they announce they have made an arrest. I think in Kalamazoo. Is that what I recall? Uh, he's from Kalamazoo and they brought him to uh, Wayne County, which is Detroit. Right. So, yeah. but they would not reveal the identity of that person or the circumstances. Correct. And I don't think we've even seen a an affidavit with the arrest warrant. We saw nothing, no mugshot, no name. As far as I know, we've never seen anything. Police were incredibly tight lipped, but they said, hey, we have a suspect. And then a day or two later, gone. No more suspect. And then they, well, I, I, tell you, I, I saw this when this happened. And I thought to myself, in fact, I told my wife, I said, remember that guy I was telling you about and we talked about? And I said, well, they've released it. Everyone, stand by for a moment. We're going to do a first ever on STS. Stand on by. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Hey, Nick, what's up? Not much. How's it going? Going, going well. This is uh, Phil's adopted uh, daughter, who's not there yet, but there's Nick, the husband. <laughs> look, look there she is. is. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday, daughter. Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. Happy birthday, Happy birthday, birthday you. daughter. Happy we, birthday we, to we, you. Happy birthday, dear Abby. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. You know it's you. early, right? It's, it's actually the 26th. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, November 26th. Sometimes November 26th. Hey, your well, husband. Your, your wonderful husband. I hard to, hate to take over here, Joel, but it is my Please daughter. do, Phil. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> so your your husband sent us a te- uh, sent us an email. It's been gosh several weeks ago, oh my God. and uh, and wanted us to share in this surprise celebration of your birthday. So Thank here you. we are, and this is your moment, and we're Thank doing you. it early, of course. But uh, I'm speechless. We're just, we're just uh, really, really glad to be able to do this for you and celebrate your birthday with you in this brief moment. Well, thank you so much, you guys. You are flipping amazing. Yeah, happy I, I birthday. I don't do the Larry Levine language, okay? I'm, yeah. not, I'm not into that. I love it. Um, I'm not going to make your mom mad. Nick is husband of the year right yes, behind you. Yes, he is. Your husband Look of the him. year. Yeah. He's been contacting us for months uh, and texting <laughs> us. And I was actually going to do it next week. And then I said, you know what? It's Thanksgiving. And right? uh, <laughs> Scott and Phil might not be here. So huge happy birthday to you. What's the actual day? What day is your birthday? November 26th. It's the same day as one of your wife's best friends. Wife's mm. best friends. I don't know who yeah. that is. It could he be my, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's the COE. So um, <laughs> Abby, hang out with us. We got a few more stories. You're going to do that? You're going to be Absolutely. our- Absolutely. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I have you. jokes. Abby and Nick, she's got jokes. I love it. We'll take jokes. Obviously, away. she's definitely the jokester of everybody. She gets it from her dad. <laughs> yeah. My real dad. Nick, <laughs> right, Nick. right, right. Exactly. Yes. Not we want to get things that. mixed up here. Nick, you're the man. Thank you for setting that up. Where are you, Abby? Where are you located? Norton, Kansas. It's like real northwestern Kansas. Northwestern Kansas. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I thought you moved in Nebraska or something. Well, we moved from Nebraska. That's where my real dad from lives. From Nebraska. Yeah. Ah, okay. So, but it's really windy here because Nebraska blows and Oklahoma sucks. <laughs> now, don't say that. I'm from Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. The birthday wishes are coming uh, in. Happy birthday, Abby. Happy birthday. Taha, you, happy God. birthday. <laughs> happy birthday. Uh, All the birthday wishes. This is awesome. I'm glad we're doing this. Uh, happy <laughs> birthday, too. Queen Abby. Uh, today is actually my dad passed away, and I don't want to depress everyone. But today is my dad's birthday, so it's all uh, it's all in the family. And yeah. look at Ned Smith; she's even cuter than Nugget. Aww, there you go. No. Come so, on. Yeah, look at that. So, uh, so Abby, hang out with us, and What's Nick, you? hang out with us. We're gonna uh, talk something really uh, nice and kind and simple and easy on your birthday. We're just discussing murder, so stand by. Um, so, Phil, what about this? Samantha Wool, she uh, 
an arrest is made. The suspect is let go. What on earth is going on here? Is this a big uh, bumbling by the uh, Detroit Police Department for even well, announcing I, that that is suspect? Why would they have announced that as suspect if it's the wrong guy? I, I don't. When I saw this and I talked to my wife about it, I was curious as to why they even went to all this trouble to announce that they've made an arrest and then don't reveal anything about the arrest. Uh, and especially, I mean, you know, no, no affidavit for the arrest warrant. I mean, just the stuff under seal. And so I don't know what all that means. I think I've read somewhere where this person, I don't guess we even know if it's male or female, right? We don't. Yeah, we so don't. This person had made some admissions and I guess based on those admissions, they were able to, I, I'm trying to think what I would be doing if, if I'm working this case. And so my question is, what did they have that got them enough probable cause to make this arrest in the first place? Because that's all they need to have. Mm. And then once they got that, and I, I saw something about where there had been some admissions or this person had said some things. And they were not able to verify those things, corroborate those things. And so they, they released this person. So that whole thing to me, if it were me, and, and of course, I don't know what they know, but from the outside looking in, making that kind of an arrest, I would not have said anything about it. I don't know if they were, if they made that statement to calm down the community because there's, you know, all the speculation that it's, it's a hate crime and they were saying from the beginning, it's not a hate crime. So I, I have no idea what the philosophy was or the logic was behind this series of events regarding this case, mystery arrest, mystery release. I don't understand it. And I don't know that we ever will until they put somebody in custody that they, they maintain in custody, that they identify as being in custody and looks like this is the person that they're going to go to trial on. So I, and uh, so it's a very, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't bode well for the investigation just from the outside looking in, in, in my, in my view. So mm. very odd. Odd series of events. Yeah, sure is. Jessica K says, super sticker. It's also Ski Hat Sarah's actual birthday. Happy birthday, Sarah. And obviously, happy birthday. Abby, how did you find our show? How did you ever find us in the first place? Oh, you're muted. It's husband I got, Nick. I got my COE over here, okay? There, there you go. <laughs> so uh, how did you find us? Um, well, it definitely happened with the Idaho four. Um, mm. so over a year ago now, and you know what, I don't re exactly remember, but what drew me in, I know what made me stay though. What made you stay? It's like your guys' honest, genuine coverage, like just the realness of it. The community is awesome. Like shout out to my girls out there. Well, they're mostly girls, maybe except Nick Spunky, but mm. <laughs> love them all like it's just been an awesome community and it just feels like you're part of something bigger i guess um i know that sounds corny no doesn't at all i would <laughs> say best guess better community does nick watch or is he just pretending that he wa is watching well it, it was a little well uh oh uh oh wi-fi is freezing uh oh uh oh tornado in kansas <laughs> the wind yeah. She's going to be, she'll be back. Oh boy. She's going to be screaming at Nick. Look at that. It's a beautiful shot for us. Frozen. Up. Okay. You guys are back. You, you froze up for a sec. Yeah. It's the crappy Kansas Wi-Fi. What can I say? Mm. It's, Wendy. Uh, it's like the wizard of Oz. Um, <laughs> so you're going to, you're going to stick through. We're going to do a few more stories and you hang out with us. Um, I would love to. Thank you. Quite welcome. Scott Duffy to you. Uh, the Detroit police put out a statement. Um, I was too lazy to type it up as a graphic. And so was the COE because it's Friday and we're tired, but it goes as such. This crime reflects a common challenge in our line of work. When arrest, when an arrest is made as the investigation unfolds, 
We appeal to the community for any information and appreciate your patience as investigators thoroughly examine every aspect of this case. Our heartfelt thoughts remain with Miss Wool's loved one. What uh, Miss Wool's loved ones? To me, this sounds like the D Detroit PD really screwed up. They kept it under wraps, didn't tell anybody anything. Then they go and arrest someone. This person seems to not be the suspect and have to let them go and then put out some statement where they're pussyfooting around. What do you think's going on here, Scott? And keep in mind, tensions are very high globally, anti-Semitism at an all-time high. What's going on? She's the president of a synagogue. Everyone immediately said this is a hate crime. They're saying it's not a hate crime. Unravel this for us, uh, Scott Duffy. What is happening? Why would they have announced a suspect and then unannounce a suspect? And and if I could, I think if I'm misunderstanding this, is did they announce that they arrested this per this suspect, that they charged this suspect, or was it that they had to come out publicly to say there was a there was an arrest? But the person that they suspected was arrested on unrelated, a violation of probation or something. Which they, they, only, quite a bit. they gave like no details. But as far as I know, they, they said the only thing they said is that they had a suspect in custody. And then suddenly there wasn't. They didn't even yeah. say there was an arrest. This is an interesting point. Could it be that it's a minor yeah. who was arrested? I have no idea. Yeah. But even if it was a minor, why would they have let that minor go if it was a crime as serious as homicide, yeah. but what, what are you thinking? Scott? Well, if I might make my second interruption here, please, please. So my, again, you can get an arrest warrant with no chart, with no charges. Um, I got them all the time. We call them pocket warrants and we used them in the, in fact, in our interview stuff, we would use them, but uh, you know, just getting that and, and, and you just need the PC to make that arrest. And so once they weren't clear, about as talk about Scott's on they weren't really clear what they were arresting them for, but the impression was that they were arresting them related to this murder. And so, but there were no charges filed. So then he's released. So, you know, one doesn't always equal the other in regards yeah. to charges and so forth. So I don't, Scott, if that answers your, yeah. your question yeah. or not, but that this thing was just kind of like we've made an arrest, we're announcing the arrest. We're not telling you who we arrested, and now we're releasing this person. Yeah, so very, and, and very sketchy. That would make that would make sense. I I feel like uh, Joel, you said it that this it, it's it's timing. So if it was let's just say it was a month or or a day before October seventh, and maybe or maybe this doesn't get out of the Detroit circuit. And uh, and then, of course, a notable Jewish member of the community is killed. So you are making some assumptions of a hate crime, if if not a domestic related uh, homicide. But it still probably doesn't get the, the the international attention that this really seemed to get very quickly as a result of of uh, October 7th. Right. And so now you have yeah. this immediate and and uh, high stress and so thereby they feel like hey we have nothing but we have somebody who's opening his mouth so let's go get a material witness warrant let's do something to to grab this guy it, it, it could be a communication issue with they they jumped the gun they made an announcement or somebody perhaps a newspaper uh, a journalist was going to hey we're going to we're going to go ahead and and say you guys are are hot in the tail of somebody. And so, so they jump the gun, they say something. And then all of a sudden, just like, you know, took the air out of the tire. Oh, nothing to see here. The, the, the person was released. It's uh, has nothing to do with anything. Well, so, yeah. And, it, and it's, we talked about this, I think either last week or the week before, but when I, when I read what was released in terms of when the event occurred, when the crime occurred, it didn't it didn't strike me as being anything related to what was going on in the in the world uh it, it looked to me to be something more personal no forced entry she was stabbed inside the house she walked outside of the house and that's where she died so 
it, it didn't. And of course, we don't know what the scene looked like inside. I mean, in terms of disarray and that kind of thing. But this just struck me from the beginning as being something more personal than universal. So I, 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 yeah. I just don't. Uh, but the, but again, I don't know if you've got a chief up there that's trying to, you know, kind of keep things down because everything is so emotional now regarding Israel and that kind of thing. And she, I, my my sense is that if she were if she were some other ethnicity, if she was not Jewish, mm. we would have heard nothing about this. Yeah. Yeah, I and, think, uh, and so I think it, it's like to, to use what Scott just said. There may have been nothing to see here ever. I mean, in terms of trying to connect what's happening in Israel and what's happening with anti-Semitism and and to this particular event, this this incident, this murder. So I think there were just some really bad uh, decisions made. In regarding how do we communicate this in a way that doesn't alarm the public further. And I think there were just some missteps here. I, I'm still, the whole thing with me, with me is, is why would you release that we've made an arrest, but we're not going to identify who that person is and why we may, at least give us something. There was nothing in the system. You know, I, I tell you what, maybe it's different in Michigan. I don't know, in Detroit. In Harris County, Texas, now they did, they got an arrest warrant, so that would not have been entered into the system. So that explains to me now why there was nothing in the system. He wasn't charged with anything. Once you're charged, that stuff is in the system, and anybody can pull that stuff up. By the way, Andy's school is in Detroit, has been following this story closely. The FBI got involved here because they couldn't trust the Detroit Police Department, but sad but true, other officers were all... Let me, look... Phil's getting upset. Go ahead. Well, I'm not not getting upset. It's just that FBI got involved. The FBI doesn't get involved. The FBI, and Scott, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I can tell you the 33 years that I was in law enforcement, 23 years in homicide division, the FBI never, it's not like die hard. Gentlemen, I give you the FBI. That is not the way it works. The FBI doesn't get involved. The FBI is requested to support the investigation with the resources they have. And so when I hear this, people have this, Scott, again, correct me if I'm wrong here, but this is a misconception. Yeah. My and sense that, is because of what was going on internationally, the Detroit PD asked the FBI for their resources to help them in this investigation, to find out or let you know eliminate the fact that this was not some sort of hate crime, anti-Semitic act. So let's let's I, I just I want to clarify that for everybody. The FBI doesn't come, doesn't swoop in in the big, you know, federal jet and say, we're the FBI and we're taking over. They just don't do that. What the FBI does is after the investigation is successfully completed, then they take credit for everything. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Yeah. And I'll add to that. There there is no federal statute for murder. It's... um, there are other crimes that result in murder. So, so, for example, if if this was suspected because of October 7th, a hate crime or a domestic terror, the FBI would be working jointly, parallel with DPD. And then if it was de- determined to be one of those two motives, the FBI would... would um, and this, these discussions are between the bosses of the agencies to say, hey... It's, it's better to go this way versus that way. So there is no homicide statute in the federal system, though there are crimes that when death results, of course, it raises the uh, ultimately sentencing. So that's uh, absolutely the, the there. There's no murder statute unless, of course, you're on a, um, you know, you're in a federal territory where. Um, you have your Indian territories, you have other federal land, 
so thereby homicide would would be um would be used because but but, but outside of that there's no federal nexus um and there must be a uh, a predicate so for example hate crime terror kidnapping interstate resulting in homicide things like that uh so people want to play a game um abby let's see how well you know your father by the way black widower from the republic of ireland has a bone to pick with you because she says you have a real father and uh she doesn't like you co-opting phil waters but we're gonna <laughs> allow that a uh, question for abby what is your father phil's this phil's favorite movie can you answer that i don't know for sure but i've got a couple of good guesses let's, give let's us go a with a time to kill green mile tombstone <laughs> that's good answers <laughs> or grandma's uh, boy the first two the first two you listed were are were good movies <laughs> and, and i enjoyed them those are good guesses the last one you listed would be in the top three all right. What was so the last one? There, 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 there are probably, um, I'm trying to think of what the third one is, but there are two movies definitely that anytime I see them, if I'm scanning through the guide, I will stop and it doesn't matter where they are in the movie. I will stop and watch them to the end. So one of them's Dirty Dancing. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right up there with the... Uh, <laughs> the, the, the piano or whatever that silly thing was. Anyway, um, Tombstone and Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Oh, my real dad loves that movie too. Mm. Abby, what is, is your dad, is your real dad is your real dad a homicide detective, Abby? You know, unfortunately, he's just an old retired fire department uh, oh. chief. Well, that's all right. Everybody loves firemen. Hey. <laughs> A fire department so, chief, that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, he was, he was loves in, firemen. In hey, they Nebraska. do the job. I would never do it. I would never do that job. Mm -mm, I couldn't Those either. guys run into burning buildings. I'm not going to do that. Running into burning buildings. Yeah, it's a it's a lot. There's a lot more to it than you'd ever think. But yeah, he's a retired fire department chief in Kearney, Nebraska. Like, you know, Kearney's for a festival. Mm. But um, he, uh, yeah, he just retired not too long ago. Um he hasn't missed a day of work in his life. This guy's a tough dude. Like yeah. he's he's something. Gotta but they be. see a lot of stuff. Thank him for his service. Oh, he, I he, will. He a, he he's gonna be here soon. He's gotta come to get me in line. So we need to get <laughs> we need to get him on uh as a best guest and uh see Heck what yeah. happens. Oh my gosh. I'm reading this uh just Oh I mean other, the third the third movie is uh is not is not quite as intense, but it's the uh Talladega Nights, the Ricky Bobby story. Oh, <laughs> I love it. I think we're going to watch that tonight now. <laughs> Shivani says. And I do like the Big Lebowski. So, I mean, yeah, of course, yeah, you like that one. The rug yeah. really puts the room together. <laughs> Shivani, uh, Detroit claimed to have a suspect for the killing of Dr. Devin Hoover. That's the neurosurgeon who was murdered in his attic. Um, or at least rolled up in a carpet there. And they said that they had a suspect and nothing on that either. So, uh, get your act together, Detroit police department. We're watching. Let's see what happens On to another, um, horrific story here. Tiffany Lucas, 32 years old, Scott and Phil, I told you about her last week. She shot and killed her two young boys, ages six and nine. Well, now she is blaming social media, uh, Scott Duffy. She's saying that she was manipulated by social media to commit the crime. Um, and the quote goes like this. After police took Lucas in for questioning, she said the incident was an accident. Um, I would never do anything like this unless someone manipulated me. She said she was being manipulated by Facebook, the Internet, and Wi-Fi. Um, is this a woman who has had a psych psychotic break, Scott Duffy, or just looking for a poor excuse to get out of a double homicide of her very own children. Yeah, I, it's very disturbing. And, and we've seen it quite a few times of parents taking the lives of their children, one parent or another, that is. And, uh, and yeah, men mental health is very much a, uh, a component. 
to some of these, but but at the same time, we we don't know what we don't know, and I don't I don't I don't know what her life was leading up to. I don't know what's in her life. I don't you know all those things are going to be important to to kind of f- put some pieces together. Ult- ultimately, you know, to um, I, I just it's. It's devastating. It's just absolutely devastating. It's yeah. unfathomable. Abby, there you have kids, kids, right? I do. I have one of my own who's 16 and then my three bonus kiddos, mm, two boys look, and two girls. Abby, you look too young to have a 16-year-old. Pharaoh Gamma. I'm going to be 40. Yeah, you look, you, look, you look very good for your age. Pharaoh Gamma <laughs> says, Dirty Harry, Phil, for Phil. Uh, as one of your favorite, I films. do like Dirty. He's on the list too. Dirty Harry's on the list. Yep. Bill, if you're scrolling through your cable tonight, are you stopping if Dirty Harry is on? I would. Yeah, Dirty would. Harry's another one. There you go. Um, I'm sure, if I sit here long enough, I'll come up with a bunch of movies. But uh, you know, do you, Phil, do you and your wife I'll have the your same? Huckleberry. Does your wife like rom coms, as they say, or and do you guys have very different um, taste in movies, Phil? What is rom com? Romantic comedy. <laughs> uh, I have suffered through some of those, and uh, yes, of course she 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 likes she likes that stuff. Um, but uh, and some of them are funny, you know. But um, it's not. Probably not on the top of my selection. If they're comedies, now if, I mean if they've got the romantic aspect. But if they're funny, you know, like when Harry met Sally, you know, something like that. I mean, yeah, I think those are funny, and I like them, and all that good stuff. But just the the sappy, formulaic romantic comedies, no. So predictable. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Mona says, I would think Phil likes John Wayne flicks. My mom once said to me, I always wanted a son that was a strong, silent type like John Wayne. She uh, picked wrong by having me, but I did get a, a lighter. I've got a, I've got a box set of John Wayne movies. So, yeah, yeah, just about any John Wayne movie I'll stop and watch. Yep. And what about the Coen brothers here, uh, Phil? Oh, Waters? yeah. I'll do those. Oh, yeah. I love them. They're, they're great. <laughs> Fargo. Yeah, they're great. What about Quentin Tarantino? We got to throw him in there. I'm not a big Quentin Tarantino fan. I've seen a couple, you know, a few of his movies, but I'm not. I'm not a big fan. He, I wouldn't stop to watch the rest of one of those movies. But there's uh, a couple I would stop to watch. But Coen Brothers that. for sure. Abby, was your father strict growing up? I I know a couple of firefighters. They're uh, they're like <laughs> Phil. They're a little. They're OCD. They're very clean. They're neat. Um, was your father strict? Who my poor dad, Jim Tahahaha. He had five girls. Mm. That's it. So um, we talk more about like hair removal and manscaping and stuff mm. like that. It's not strict at all. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, New Britain, Pauly, you say you're a real UFC fan. How come you haven't covered the Kane Velasquez case? It's actually a good point. I had Mark Aragos on, who's his defense attorney. Um, we should follow it moving forward. Uh, they're going to trial. I mean, he's out on bond now, and uh, that was a tragic story, kind of a crazy story. I'm not going to get into it right now. Uh, look at this. Boston Strong Firefighters here. Thank you for your service. Moving on here. Scott Duffy, the Visine murder. I don't know if you heard about this. There was a Wisconsin woman. Her name is Jessie Kurcheski. She's 39 years old. She was just convicted this week. She was taking care of a woman um, under her care, 61 or 62-year-old woman. That woman wound up dead. Uh, it was an odd case because it turns out that the cause of her death was tetrahydrosoline, uh, which is otherwise known as visine eye drops, apparently mixed into a glass of water, uh, which is what killed her. The defendant said she was suicidal, that she didn't do it. An odd way to commit murder, isn't it? There's many ways to kill a, a person. Yeah, that is. I, I've, I've, um, I've seen a few through antifreeze. You know, a little bit here, 
in in mixed drinks um and and i imagine that was um was that all in one shot or was it a little bit in each poke poisoning right? apparently i think it was oh, a one poison. shot deal it was uh six That's or seven a lot of visine. yeah it's a, a lot of, of yeah yeah I wonder what Visine tastes like, but it's it, it's odd to me, Scott Duffy, because you're putting Visine into your eyeballs, mm -hmm. which is connected to your mouth and brain. Why is Visine poisonous? I don't. I, I, do you see MD by my at the end of <laughs> Phil Waters? Why is Visine poisonous, Phil? MD, Doctor Phil. Doctor. Well, Phil. there's a difference between putting it in your eyes and ingesting it. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm no doctor and I don't play one on television, but uh, there's a. Uh, there's a difference in the way it's 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 entering the body. So when you're talking about ingesting something, that's going into everything. When you're talking about dropping it in your eyes, it's going in your eyes. So uh, there you go. But that's an interesting. I, I think she must have seen that. There was another Visine case, if I recall, and I think she must have seen it and decided this was the way to go. And uh, so it's uh, it's despicable what she did. So uh, and she was found guilty, right? Didn't found I read guilty. she was found convicted? Guilty? Convicted. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, so next story, and then we'll one more, and we'll wrap it up. There's a guy named Samuel Haskell, whose father is important, named Sam Haskell. Samuel Haskell, the son, um, he's now accused of murdering his wife, May Haskell, and her parents, Gashon and Yan Jang. Uh, he hired day laborers, Phil Waters, to remove heavy garbage bags from his home in Tarzana, California. In those bags, they found some torsos. Uh, his children that he had with this woman were not found. He's being held without bond. Uh, they also allege a special circumstance of multiple murders in addition to the murder charges. I don't know what that means. What's interesting here is Samuel Haskell is the son of producer and Hollywood agent Sam Haskell, who represents Whoopi Goldberg, Dolly Parton, and at one time, George Clooney. Phil, I'm going to ask you a very simple question. Why, if you have so much in life, you're born into privilege, do you go and murder your wife and her parents, put them in garbage bags, and then have a day laborer come and unload them? Why are you just not looking into the horizon saying, my father was George Clooney's agent, I'm driving my Rolls Royce because of my father and my Ferrari, and I'm just going to drive into the sunset and enjoy my life. Why are you going and murdering your wife and the grandparents of your own children? Because anyone is capable of any action or the right set of circumstances and evil can manifest itself regardless of what your social economic status may be. It's a problem of the heart and the head. The COE is here in a panic. Um, all state roadside assistance is here to help with the minivan. But here's a first world problem. Ethel Bug Johnson, my daughter with four legs and the longest tongue you'll ever see. She goes to school one or two days a week to run out energy. And she is at Waggle Brothers. And so the COE just tiptoed in here and said to me, what do I do? The Allstate roadside assistance guy is coming and Ethel is still at school. And you know what I said to her? I'm podcasting. It's 647. I'm going to let her handle that. Welcome to. Um, oh, what is you'll, pay we're, later. you'll pay later. This is why we're going to be a, uh, a Super Bowl halftime show. COE, I love you. There, there you go. COE. The, you're getting, this is why we will be a Super Bowl halftime show. Because I'm conducting a show, a very serious show. <laughs> about true crime stories of the week. And my wife comes in to tell me that the all state roadside assistance guy is here and she has to get the dog. Two more very quick, very quick stories. Uh, this one caught my eye, Phil waters for one reason and one reason only. This is a North Carolina child psychiatrist, a medical doctor <clears throat> sentenced now to 40 years in prison. He was found guilty in May of numerous charges related to child sex abuse images and videos. His name is David Tatum. He practiced medicine in Charlotte, North Carolina. This is what's fascinating to me, Phil. He used AI. You don't know what rom-coms are, but you do know what AI is, correct? Artificial intelligence. He used AI to create explicit images of children. And it freaked me out because essentially 
he could take a photo of my child and then turn it into child porn using AI. How is technology going to manipulate evidence, you know, manipulate crimes? And it, in a way, it's uh, it's created. He's caught with something that's essentially not real, but yet real. I don't even know how to. I don't know what I'm asking. Other than it's a it, double-edged sword. I don't, yeah, is there a question in there somewhere? I don't know. Uh, well, you know what? Abby's the best guest. Abby, what do you think of that? Isn't that freaky? Like they could get a picture of your daughter hypothetically and turn it into child porn through AI. How freaky is that? It gets my grinds a gear. Yeah, my my gears are a grinding. But like, it's a double edged sword when it comes with social media and like all the technology. I think because obviously it invites like so much more crime and like you know just preying on these little kids and stuff like that but at the same time we love our ring doorbells because they catch the perps you know um so it's a double-edged sword i mean technology's it's definitely something but yeah you come after my daughter i'm gonna call phil right away and we're both gonna go get you yeah <laughs> and by the way he was also installing uh cameras and bathrooms and doing that sort of thing but just phil i guess the question is Things can be manipulated with technology now, particularly artificial intelligence. How does that change the crime scape, if you will? Because um, you're looking at photos, but they're not actual photos. They were manipulated, but yet they're still pornography. How do you deal with that? Well, you deal with it like you deal with the real deal. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the same crime. It's the same depraved freaking stuff that these people are doing. I think this guy may have thought that because he's creating these images, they're not, he didn't put people together and take pictures of these images. He's just creating them out of his own sick head that uh, somehow he was going to separate himself from the crime. And that's just not, that's not what he's being charged with. He's got these images. It doesn't matter where they, where they came from. So, but it, it's just uh, th this technology as it keeps going on and, and getting bigger and for lack of a better term, better, I guess, in the sense that they can do more things with it. Uh, it just, it's another, it's another means by which people can commit acts of evil. And that's just the world we live in now. And so, yes, you know, for all the bedwetters that are going to say, you know, what about mental illness? It is evil. There's good and evil in the world. You're either on the side of good or you're on the side of the evil. That's it. So uh, that's what these things are. And I guarantee you, you ask, there may be some out there that would think differently. You ask any victim, any victim's family, that has been uh, burdened with some act of evil on them by some perpetrator, they're going to tell you that's what it was. They're not going to couch it in terms of trying to soften up what happened and trying to explain it. Mm -hmm. There are just things that people do that are unexplainable because as I've just said, anyone is capable, anyone, me, Abby, Scott, you, the COE, anyone is capable of any act under the right set of circumstances. And these people like this guy that's generating these images with AI, he finds himself in a situation. He's probably been a geek all his life. Mm -hmm. And now he's, you know, he's having, I'm sure he's having wet dreams all day long about this thing, this AI stuff. And look what I can generate. And he's done it, and he's gotten caught. And then he's going, what did you say? He's going to, uh, he's been caught putting cameras in places? Yeah, cameras. So he he not only, a, but, yeah. but I can tell you, so here's the problem for a guy like this. Yeah. He had, by the way, he had a patient in therapy, and he was filming up her skirt while she was sitting in the chair across from him. Well, so how nice. Go. So here, here's, the, here's the thing. Even though he's creating these images, with AI, that is still not satisfying him. It's not gratifying him. He's not being satiated by the images he's creating. So what do you have to do? You got to go get the real deal. 
So now we got the cameras up the skirts and all that. He's still got to go back to reality to really get some sort of gratification, and he'll never be satiated because now he's got he's got the best of in his mind the best of both worlds. Mm. But these people are never like satiated. The lines of um, being with it and being in your fantasy world is just blurred at that point. Like he's so far gone that what's the next step now that you've been that disgusting this whole time, you're just going to get grosser and grosser as it goes. And he just, mm, yeah. Gross. And, and he was, uh, and he was a, uh, a licensed psychiatrist. So uh, it is a very scary thing. Final story. And then I'm going to have to run because I can hear the commotion. I think the uh, COE left the kids to handle all state, uh, the all state roadside guy and, I should probably just let him handle it. It's how you grow tough. Back in the day, I would have to handle the Allstate roadside guy. Today, kids are being coddled, Scott Duffy. and No sippy oh, cups. No, I'm going to let them go out there. And it's, by the way, it's raining here again. And uh, let them deal with the greasy Allstate roadside assistance guy who is here. Scott Duffy, this last one I, I only took for you for no other reason. Have you ever heard of, where is his name? Where is his name? Where is his Keith Gibson. Keith Gibson. A jury just found a 41-year-old suspected serial killer guilty of several charges relating to a brutal crime spree that occurred two years ago. The Delaware Attorney General's Office announced in a statement that Keith Gibson was convicted of 25 crimes, including four counts of first-degree murder, one count of attempted murder, 13 counts of possession of a firearm, on and on it goes, facing a mandatory life sentence. This all happened in... Wilmington, Delaware, Scott Duffy, your neck of the woods. Wow, in, I did not hear that. And in <laughs> Philadelphia, and in Philadelphia. Huh. He's also believed to have killed four people in Philadelphia. I chose this. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you yeah. Would say, yeah, of yeah, course yeah. I, I've heard okay. about this. Let's come back. It started before I left. Yeah. And I heard your jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He killed his mother in Germany. Scott town. needs to get out more. Yeah. yeah. The, the name, the name uh, now I know. It's um, I believe if that's if it's the same case, it was a um, maybe I should research it. But but it's coming to mind where there was a uh, Delaware probationer. That's somebody on probation. He went into Philadelphia. And um, and then I think, you know, his he might have lost touch with his regular. You know, staying in touch with probation. And then went on a massive crime spree through Philadelphia and um, and Wilmington. So I wasn't aware that it actually uh, came to trial. But but um, I believe his um, his mother was killed. Some other people were killed, and then there was some robberies. and And uh, it 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 sounds like when this unfolded some years ago um, that that it's finally come to to a trial. So that's good. That's um, I do remember that taking place. And I think I am pretty sure it, it, uh, it started before I actually retired. So. Wow. Look how nice this is. Copper whore. She gifted 150 memberships today. She said she did it in memory of my father, mm -hmm. the great Dr. Roy Wallman. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I'm still numb to the fact that my dad is gone. Probably in a couple of years, I will just, break down hysterically crying right in front of all of you. But from now, the numbness is still there. Um, Abby Tahaha, by the way, is Nick a firefighter? I've got to ask. No, Nick is a, he's a Pepsi man. Oh, there you go. He, he sells the Pepsi to everyone. Mm. I, if he was a Coke man, I'd be a lot happier. I like Pepsi, but I love, <laughs> I'm a, I'm a Are Coke. you sure? No, I don't know if that came out right. Uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Coke addict. It's really Coca -Cola bad. Coca-Cola guy. Well, yeah, well, McDonald's it's getting Coke worse. Is the best. Yeah, you're getting worse every time you speak, Joel. It's uh, yeah, yeah. I'm putting my. You can't beat a McDonald's Coca-Cola, though. You I can't. will give you that. He, you he maybe you know Scott. We would call that. He did mission, used to be a right? cop. He was. He was a cop. Oh yeah. How come he left law enforcement? Because somebody called him a crackety a word mf'er. I don't know. And that's why he left. <laughs> no, that's, that's just one of my took? favorite stories. Oh. When he loaded up the perp, you crackety amf -er. <laughs> Um, Abby, keep it clean. What are you doing tonight? 
What are you and Nick doing tonight? Well, we're going to go to see some Friday Night Lights. Go Norton Blue Jays. We're um, sub-state right now. So that's why my dad's headed down here right now. What does that There's mean, sub-state? What does sub-state sub mean? It's like the game before the state championship oh. game. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, what's the, what's the puppy's Abby's name? That's puppy. That's Abby's puppy, though. Millard Fillmore. Oh, that's Miller Fillmore. Oh, my God. <laughs> Named after Phil? Is he named um, after Phil? Duh. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Millard Fillmore named after Phil. Phil Water. Hi, Hi Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> he yeah, looks he's like a sweetheart. He's Phil a really Water, nice dog. What's, what's your plan? By the way, someone yelled at me for calling the Allstate Road. So I, I meant he was greasy, like, because he's under cars getting greasy. I didn't mean With it. With the uh, oil. Yes, that's what I meant. I didn't mean it. I know. In a, a I had your back on that one. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. So, and I can hear my kids. They're worried. They're worried about the Allstate man. Uh, Scott Duffy, what are your plans tonight? Oh, I think uh, Friday night, maybe I, there's a local Christmas bazaar at our church. Ooh. So I think I'm going to um, mm. head over there. That's it's that's hard. that's big on the list tonight. It's hard to believe that it's that time of year. Uh, yeah. it, it did feel like fall because of the rain in Miami, but it's back in the 80s. So it doesn't quite feel like the holidays here. Mm. Um, Phil Waters, how big a holiday is Thanksgiving in your household next week? Will well, you, will you carve a turkey? And do you like cranberry, Phil? I do not. And by the way, do we want to do a show next Friday? It's up to you guys if you want to. Well, do I will tell you. So to answer your first question, I will be, my wife and I will be in Piedmont, California mm. with my entire family mm. for Thanksgiving. That's beautiful. So no show next Friday, guys. So I'm glad we brought Abby on this week. We're going to take a week off. Yeah. I think everyone needs it. Yeah, take um, a break next week, the day after Thanksgiving, because, uh, you know, and uh, and then I've got, uh, well, I should be able. December 5th, I'm getting knee replacement surgery. So what? I may be, I may be out, of the, out of the loop here for a, for a while, but I'll, I'll let you know. I'll let That's, you know about that. Come on well, in. Let me know champ. if you need a ride. I got. Yeah. I picked my dad up from his last knee surgery. Oh, that, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. that. I am back in Texas, up. so. I know it's a lot easier to get there. <laughs> oh, speaking of a, speaking of AI images, this is uh, this is the champ right here, Judah Mac. My mom's hey, gonna Judah. call and scream. She's gonna call and scream. Uh, Phil, I can. When did you know that you were having? Um, this knee replacement because this is some serious stuff i'm worried for well you. this just this just came about i mean the knee replacement came about uh last saturdays when it had to happen but um no this has been my right leg has been a uh if it could talk uh there are some stories that mm. i mean through uh motorcycle accidents and uh Four wheeler accidents and martial arts and Marine Corps and 33 years in law enforcement, being on a SWAT team and and uh, playing racquetball. And it just uh, it finally and I had it operated on when I was in the Marines 40 years ago. But it finally uh, finally gave up the ghost. So I'm going to get it replaced. Wow. Um, guys, you may. uh we might not have Phil back on the show for a year, but we're going to keep no, uh, no. good tabs on him. We'll, it won't we'll, be that bad. We'll see how he does. Um, everyone, um, I'm being yelled at to go get Ethel, so we're going to wrap up this show. Everyone have a beautiful, I guess we're going to say uh, sort of goodbye until uh, after Thanksgiving. Um, Judah, do you want to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving? Say happy Thanksgiving. That is how... They're very Happy nice. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Are you an undercover police officer? Oh, yeah. Does an undercover police officer work <laughs> under a blanket or above a blanket? <laughs> under a blanket. Okay. And are you a Ninja Turtle? Yes. And are you stronger than Thor? Oh, no. Are you stronger than an average Ninja Turtle? 
Oh boy, here come here here they come one at a time. Oh, oh right. boy. Oh boy, they're all coming online. Hello, Hello Vida. how are you? This is Vida. This is Vida, everyone, which is how like are you, Vida? Good. Vida. I'm just okay, you can say you don't have to lift the microphone up. Where's Ethel? <laughs> Where's the all state uh, all state guy? You know, this is the part of this thing that uh, there are some people out there that are just scrooges. You know, they they don't like this part of the show. Oh, I know. They don't they don't like the the babble, you know, they don't they don't yeah. like that stuff. You know, babble. Like, this is some of the yeah. deepest conversation you can have. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, yeah, get they can a, buzz you know, off. Yeah, lighten they can up buzz. Francis, which is another one of my favorite movies, too. Stripes. <laughs> By the way, before we go, a quick happy birthday. It's Abby's birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Abby. Happy birthday to you. And that's your dog, Miller Fillmore. Guys, we'll see you after Thanksgiving. This is completely devolved into insanity. Here we go. See you after Thanksgiving. Yay.